Hello and welcome. Thank you for listening to today's segment. We'll be asking Professor Futh in-depth questions about psychology with incentive to help us understand and engage in deeper thought. Without a further ado, that interview starts now. I'm here with Professor Futh. Could you describe your occupation a little bit for us? Yeah, no problem. So I am an adjunct professor here at Point Park University. And I'm also a professor at Seton Hill University in Greensburg. So I teach students. I've taught a number of classes, Introduction to Ethics, Introduction to Philosophy. Uh, I will be teaching an online class this summer. And I'm also teaching currently Critical Thinking and Logic and Argumentation. What is the general definition of philosophy? Philosophy literally comes from the Greek terms meaning love and wisdom. So philosophy means love of wisdom. and what that often boils down to is people trying to figure out the way that the universe works by asking questions, by reflecting on their own beliefs, by having discussions with others. I like to characterize philosophy as the search for truth, an understanding of the way things are, how things work, etc. How broad of an audience would you say philosophy reaches? Oh, anybody has the potential to be a philosopher. You don't have to be an academic. You don't have to have any formal study necessarily. The only thing that you really need is an open mind and a willingness to try to figure out the way the world works, uh, which involves a lot of self-reflection, a lot of conversation. Anybody who's trying to figure out how things work is doing philosophy. I asked how much of an audience does philosophy reach, but how oh. many people does it really affect? I think it depends on how we've defined it here. So academic philosophy, what a lot of PhDs do in the academy, probably doesn't reach too many people. It is pretty much a game that a lot of academic researchers play mm -hmm. where they're doing research into different disciplines and issues and kind of having arguments over the finer points of these issues amongst themselves. We can kind of talk about academic philosophy as being pretty insulated, as not affecting too many people. But if we interpret philosophy more broadly as the search for truth, the search for understanding, uh, you'll see it in every discipline, right? In science, in creative writing, in mathematics. And if we interpret philosophy more broadly like that, it affects everybody. It's something that has impacts on the way society functions, uh, how politics works, uh, how we think economics work. We can interpret it in the narrow way or in the broader way. I like interpreting it in the broader way. And so I like to think that philosophy can and does impact pretty much everyone. Uh, what they just don't realize is that they are thinking philosophically or that philosophy is having that impact on them because they often haven't been given a term to attach to what they're trying to do in their lives, which is normally trying to figure out how stuff works. If it does affect a lot of people like that, why should people care about philosophy? That is a good question, and it's not clear if you interpret it in the narrow way uh, why anybody would really want to do it or care about it. Uh, but if you interpret it in the broader way that I've been talking about here, uh, philosophy has a lot of positive consequences. So if you do it right, it helps you understand the way the world works better. It increases your critical thinking skills. It connects people because a lot of what philosophy uh, is involved with is having conversations with others. The way the ancient Greeks did philosophy, and this is where we get the phrase the Socratic method comes from, is through conversation. Insofar as it gives you a better knowledge of the way the world works and increases your critical thinking skills, I think it is a really important thing to engage in. And that's why I would say people should care about it and people should probably study it. Is it likely for people to run into misinformation? It depends on how you interpret philosophy. So there are certainly a lot of books and a lot of articles out there that are going to espouse certain worldviews, uh, that are going to make certain claims that a lot of people are going to disagree with. If you kind of have a more scientific mind, think that a lot of what philosophy has to say is rubbish or it's useless, because a lot of times philosophy is talking about very complex issues that really can't be measured using scientific instruments. But I would say that if you interpret what all these philosophers are doing, what all these great writers throughout literature have been doing, if they're thinking philosophically, is offering a kind of perspective on the world. And if you think about it like that, what you'll come to is it's useful and it's valuable to kind of try to engage with as many perspectives as you can and to bring them all in. In that sense, if you 
kind of view what moral philosophers, metaphysical philosophers, philosophers of science are doing, if you interpret all those as different perspectives to be interrogated, uh, then it's not so much about, well, that's inform misinformation. Oh, they have an interesting point here. They have an interesting worldview. Let's look at that a little bit, and maybe it kind of jives with what I have going on, and maybe it can increase my knowledge. It kind of depends on what the purpose and the aim of the philosopher is, but I kind of like viewing philosophy in that way and that's how I teach philosophy is I tell my students I'm not trying to give you an accurate representation of the way that I think the world works what I'm trying to do is open you up to a range of perspectives trying to expand the horizons of your consciousness in that way so that you can consider all these different views and kind of make up your own mind and think through these issues for yourself as you said philosophy is very broad and it is and that could be a very scary thing to somebody just getting into it. How can somebody deal with that? Yeah, so if you're looking at philosophy from the outside in and you've never read any philosophy texts or you've never taken a philosophy class, it can be really intimidating, um, especially because these texts are very difficult. They're very dense. They're often trying to interrogate some of the presuppositions and concepts on which our worldviews are based that we don't often question, that we're not even usually uh, aware. And so... I would just say, once you realize that anybody can be a philosopher, that should make you feel good about studying it or, or be a little bit less intimidating to intimidated about it because you can really start anywhere you want on your philosophical journey. And as long as you continue to ingest information, you're going to come to, a, I think, a more correct and a more expansive worldview. So while there is a lot to study and it's difficult, if you have the capacity for critical thinking and reflection, you've already got all the tools that you need. So it might look scary from the outside, but if you can kind of stoke within yourself a passion for figuring out the way that the world works, that will kind of see you through some of those difficult texts and some of those feelings that might stop you from engaging with it in the first place. What kind of questions does philosophy target? Oh my goodness. How many hours do we have? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you some basic ones. Uh, what is morally right and wrong? What is immoral and moral action look like? And how do we know that? What is the universe fundamentally made of? You know, what is this table in front of us? Is it just a collection of atoms and energy? And then what are atoms and energy ultimately? What is the nature of human consciousness? Are we just an amalgamation of molecules and energy and waves, or is there something else going on here? How does consciousness work? Why is politics the way that it is? How do politics operate? Are there any laws or principles to politics or history or analysis? Really, philosophy asks questions of everything. What stuff is, how it got to be like that, the kind of relationships that we have to those things, and generally, I would say, how you ought to live your life is another big question that philosophers have been trying to answer for thousands of years. These questions can never be answered or haven't been answered so far. Is there truly a master to a philosophy? There are some things that we know answers to, or at least over the course of human history, we have come to better explanations of things. I would say that nobody has a monopoly on truth. Nobody has all of the answers, which is why we continue to engage in this discipline. We're trying to come to a fuller, uh, more comprehensive knowledge of the way that things are. And so I would say, no, there really is no master of philosophy, even though philosophers throughout Western history have thought that their philosophical system was going to put an end to philosophy forever because they will have solved all of the problems. Well, that's not exactly what we see. When we interrogate some of these giant philosophical systems, what we find is there are weaknesses in them, you know, and they don't provide all the answers. So, no, we this is a, a process or a journey that I think might not have a destination. I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to come to a complete uh, and thorough and holistic explanation of what things are and why they are that way. Which then you might ask, well, then why should we engage in it at all? And I think for at least a lot of academic philosophers, they're motivated again because to ask these questions and try to find answers to them because they love it. How about for the information that we might not like? This is an issue that I think people are just going to have to kind of struggle with their whole lives. A lot of people will not uh, look at the arguments from the other side, whether that's the other side of the political aisle or the other side of the fence or whatever it is, because they are uncomfortable. But again, I don't think 
any group or person has the universe completely figured out. So I think it's a necessity that we interrogate views that uh, and think about views that might make us uncomfortable, that might make us unhappy. Because I often think there are elements of truth in those views. Now, how do we deal with that? Well, that just takes practice. If you keep yourself from investigating views that make you uncomfortable or unhappy or that shake up your worldview, you're not really going to grow that much. And so you just need to practice engaging with that stuff. Practice thinking about it. Practice putting yourself in situations in which you have to kind of contend with these views a little bit. And over time, I think you'll become more comfortable doing that. You'll become less shaken when a particular view kind of undermines your worldview or your values. So oftentimes we figure out who we are and we learn and grow through the, those trials and tribulations. So somebody with a rigid and stern mind can definitely still learn from philosophy, but not as much from somebody that is totally okay to any situation that they might read or get themselves into. Yeah, yeah. So I think anybody can learn from philosophy. You know, if they're willing to read, if they're willing to listen and talk to people, philosophy has the potential to to give anybody a lot of knowledge. The question is, how far are you going to be able to go? How much are you going to be able to learn and grow if you're not sufficiently open-minded? You know, because if you're closed off from a bunch of different views and you refuse to interrogate them or refuse to engage with them, you're limiting information that you have access to and therefore limiting the amount of perspectives that you can engage with, perspectives that might give you some sort of inkling as to what human life is all about. You're growth and your learning with respect to philosophy is going to be based a lot on how willing are you to just consume all of this information that we have in both the western and the eastern canons if you are willing to consume that information you're probably going to learn and grow more than the person who's just closing themselves off to all this stuff yeah so both western and eastern are valid to learn from i think so yeah, yeah. Again, I so I was trained in the Western canon, the Western tradition of philosophy that was kind of, we can trace its roots back to ancient Greece and Rome, and then through Europe, and then into North America, what we call the West, with a capital W in philosophy. That's the tradition that I was trained in. And the majority of the texts that I read when I was in school involved reading those texts, which privileged scientific pursuits, rationality, logical justifications for things. And that's all fine and good. Uh, but I also think there's a lot of wisdom to be found in the Eastern traditions like Buddhism and Taoism, Confucianism, even Hinduism, other Eastern religions like that. Because again, I don't think neither the East or the West has a complete, accurate view of the way the world works. I think there are elements of truth in all of these different views. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of value to even studying Eastern philosophies, for sure. Hmm. And African philosophies, Asian philosophies, what have you. Do you think there's a time that we should learn philosophy or should indulge in it? Yeah, so the amount that you're going to be able to get out of philosophy is going to be proportional to your open-mindedness and how good you are at critical thinking and how willing you are to reflect on these pieces of information. Philosophy programs in the United States uh, generally are in colleges. And so it's around 18 to 20 where students will encounter their first philosophy class or, or views of philosophy, formerly so-called. But I think philosophy education should start way earlier. We know, uh, based on studies and empirical data, that when somebody encounters information like this and they actually think about it, that their critical thinking skills are bettered. And so if you can get younger kids to actually think about some of these things and interrogate some of the beliefs that are being formed in them, I think that they're going to have a leg up generally on people who come to philosophy later like I did. I think introducing philosophy earlier in a more digestible way, you know, not so complex as college, but in a more digestible, easy to understand way to even elementary students, elementary school students and high school students would be greatly beneficial, not only for them to learn and grow as individuals uh, in moral and ethical ways, but also to improve their critical thinking skills. I don't have a particular age that I think it should start. It's probably going to differ from person to person, but I would like to see philosophy education started earlier um, and some philosophy programs in the high schools and the elementary schools because I think that would be hugely beneficial to students. Talking about when it would start, is there ever a too late 
to engage in philosophy. No, no, I don't think so. Unless, you know, you've gotten to the point, uh, you've kind of lost your mind. Uh, you know, we know people who have dementia. My grandmother had de- dementia and she ended up passing away from it. And obviously she was not able to study philosophy, right, in that mindset, in that way of life that that she was kind of trapped in. But no, it's never too late to start. It doesn't matter if you're 18 or 30 or 55 or even 70. As long as you have the capacity to think, you can start at any time. It's never too late. So if there's never too late of a time to start and we should start it earlier than we have been, what kind of information and where can we find this information to start learning? You know, the big one is the internet. Uh, We have a lot, a lot of information on philosophy, philosophers, philosophical views on the internet. There are also a lot of introductory books uh, and anthologies on these philosophers and their views. It's going to be up to each individual kind of instructor or person who wants to study philosophy to figure out what the curriculum is going to be and what it's going to look like. But A great place to start is just by poking around on the internet into issues that interest you because there's a wealth of knowledge and information on all of these issues and they're just a click away. You know, everybody has a phone nowadays, almost everybody has a computer, and so you have access to basically the entire history of Western philosophy at your fingertip. So just do some research into what interests you, what kind of topics you want to study. That would be a good place to start. And then once you know kind of where you want to start, then you can pick up those texts and start reading them physically. What kind of information would you recommend? That's a great question. I I struggle in developing my syllabi to figure out where we should start in an introductory course. I often start with metaphysics and epistemology, which are the studies of the universe, what makes up stuff in the universe and how it works, and the study of knowledge. That might not be the best place to start for a lot of people because the questions that those fields ask are very deep and fundamental. It might be better for people to start with something that has more relevance and connection to their life, like social and political theory, or maybe philosophies of life. I would recommend a lot of uh, ancient philosophers, uh, if you want to go down that route, Plato. Aristotle's a little difficult, but he's really good. I would recommend Marcus Aurelius, who was a Stoic philosopher, Roman emperor during his day. A lot of people... uh, recommend his meditations because they're very easy to read. They talk about uh, how to live your life in a very digestible way. So in my classes, I tend to go metaphysics and epistemology, then ethics, then social and political theory, and then kind of philosophies of life and existentialism. But it might be helpful for some people to kind of flip that and do metaphysics and epistemology last because those disciplines are very hard. Uh, And they ask questions that a lot of people have not really thought about, such as, what really is this table made of? You know, is it a physical thing? Is it a mental thing? You know, or do we exist in a simulation? Are we uh, existing in the mind of God or something like that? These are very deep and fundamental questions. I start there because I think ethics and social and political theory and philosophies of life, how you feel about all that stuff is going to depend on what you think the universe is and how it works which is what metaphysics tries to interrogate. But it's a very difficult discipline, very analytic, very strange if you haven't encountered these questions before. So maybe social and political theory would be a good place to start. You know, reading the founding fathers in the U.S., reading about liberalism, communism, that might be a good place to start for some, but you can't go wrong with the ancient philosophers. Would anything else you want to tell the people that might be listening? If you are afraid of philosophy, if you've never studied it before, Just look into it. You know, I think it really does have a lot of value. If you do it right, it will help you understand who you are, where you want to go, what your beliefs are, how you want to live your life. So don't be intimidated by it. There are a lot of people who don't get into philosophy because they think it's really confusing and difficult and only academics are philosophers. But anybody can do philosophy. And I think philosophy can has the potential to add a lot of value to your life. So if you haven't started your philosophy journey yet, go ahead and start it today. Just Google the word philosophy. Read the Wikipedia entry on what philosophy is. And I think you'll come to see that studying this discipline, uh, engaging with these texts, has a lot of value and potential for you and your family and your friends. Yeah. Thank you for your time.
Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. That was Professor Food. He shared his insights on philosophy in hopes for us, the listeners, to engage in deeper thought. Thank you, Point Park, for letting us produce these segments. And once again, thank you, the audience, whether it be students, old listeners, or new listeners. Thank you all for listening to the interviews that we produce. Missed the interview? Don't worry. You can find all of our interviews on our website along with other segments at WPPJ.com. See you next time.